so Dr. Sandamuthi is currently a principal research scientist at UTRC, uh, conducting research in computer vision and machine learning and building products in robotic inspection from this research. Prior to this, he was assistant professor of electrical engineering and jointly assistant professor of applied mathematics and computational science at KAUST, K-A-U-S-T, starting in 2011. He directed the computational vision lab at KAUST, which developed novel mathematics and algorithms as well as software for video and image understanding technology. Its fundamental optimization algorithm had led to advances in uh, motion-based video segmentation and detection. His group also developed technology for seismic image analysis, electronic microscopy image, and medical images. Prior to cost, he was a postdoc associate with Professor Stefano Soato in Vision Lab at uh, UCLA from 2008 to 2010. There he made fundamental contributions to the view invariance problem in object recognition, and developed technology for video tracking. His PhD is in electrical and computer engineering from Georgia Tech, so actually he was our alumni in 2008. His PhD developed fundamental shape optimization methods for computer vision that aided in technology for video tracking and medical image analysis. He was advised by Professor Anthony Yazzie. His bachelor's degree was in computer engineering and applied mathematics, uh, which uh, he also earned from Georgia Tech in 2003. He's currently an area chair for the leading computer vision conference, including CVPR and SCCV. Okay, I guess with um, all the introduction, let's welcome our speaker to give the seminar today. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, so. Today I'm going to talk about some new stuff in, that's going on in deep learning. Uh, so I'm going to sort of give you my perspective on that. Um, so my title is called Solving the Flickering Problem uh, in Modern CNNs. Uh, so what do, we, what do I mean by flickering? So suppose you have, uh, suppose you take a state-of-the-art object detector and apply it to video, you get results that look like this. Uh, so some, sometimes the object is there, sometimes it's not. Um, if it detects it, sometimes it, it goes out of view, comes into view. Um, and uh, that, that, of course, is, is not good. Um, and uh, so this looks like an, a, a small sort of annoying problem um, that we can sort of sweep under the rug and apply some conventional uh, techniques, and we should be able to correct this. Um, but it's actually a little bit more fundamental than that. And so I want to sort of give you the issues behind that. But one of, what I want to uh, say first is that, you know, ask, uh, tell you why I'm working on this. So I'm at, currently at United Technologies, which basically builds uh, most of the components for a commercial aircraft. Uh, so it builds things like the landing systems, cargo systems, engine systems. Um, and a lot of that is requiring, requiring automation. So for example, in the landing systems, uh, you want to be able to detect the runway accurately, um, and it has to be stable uh, for safety reasons. Cargo systems, uh, if, you, uh, if you automatic cargo systems that pick up crates, position them, everything has to be stable. Automatic inspection systems for engines, uh, you know, if you miss a detection uh, on a defect, that could be disastrous for an airplane, right, when it flies. Um, and so, you know, are these kind of things that this automation, is that something that is sort of uh, something nice to have or is it actually a need? Um, actually, it's, a, it's, it's actually a need. So these are the sort of the trends in the industry that we're looking at. Uh, so there's a glowing, growing urban population uh, and most of that growing urban population is a global middle class. Uh, and that growing middle class is increasingly wanting to fly between cities, right? Uh, so most of the populations between these urban, between urban cities, there's a need for more, uh, flight, uh, more flights, there's a more demand in flights, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of new types of aircraft that are coming in, um, a small aircraft where, uh, that are also requiring a lot of uh, needs. Uh, so 
Yeah, so there's really a shortage of, of pilots. So currently, we're in need of uh, roughly 30,000 pilots a year. Uh, the cost of pilots is greater than $30 billion. And if you just look at things like very simple cases, like uh, entering into the runway, there's a lot of accidents that happen there. Um, and that, that accounts for just, that already accounts for $10 billion per year. So that's, so that's a big thing. Um, and so what, we want, what we're working on at UTRC is trying to develop cyber pilots, so automatic uh, autonomy for flights. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the needs to do that is uh, validated and verified perception. So perception is, is quite a big thing um, to do this. And what do I mean by validated and verified? Well, every single component that you put on an aircraft it has to be go through rigorous, uh, a very rigorous uh, process, right? So every input that comes in, you have to provably say that this you're going to get the correct output. Okay. So what we need is like real mathematical proofs to to ensure the reliability of these systems. Without that kind of stuff, nobody's going to put it on an aircraft. All right. So back to this flickering problem. Um, so one of the questions that comes across is probably I don't need to convince many of you, but one of the issues that come across in say aerospace industry they say why why a deep learning solution can you use something else? Well, the problem is that uh, well as you know um, before deep learning it was kind of painful in the sense that we had to sort of uh, manually engineer features. Uh, the deep learning sort of automated that whole process, and so it's, there's there's a there's a more convenient automation of this whole feature learning process. Um, and it, it, it really outperformed the existing computer vision technology. Um, and so this was like, you know, right after 2013, when, um, you know, when this deep learning was demonstrated on the ImageNet benchmark, many people switched to uh, deep learning. So basically, deep, deep learning is the best uh, right now. Um, and so what we would like to do um, is to try to make it more stable. Um, so if you try you know, you, doing the usual tricks to correct this whole flickering problem, you can do data augmentation. You can you know, uh, look at the proposals, jitter them around a bit. Um, all of those you know, work a little bit, um, but it doesn't solve the main problem. You try to smooth across in time. That doesn't help either because you know, sometimes, yeah, it makes uh, things a little bit more stable, but it also gets rid of uh, true positives which is not a good thing. So it's, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, issues in this. And so when I was first started this, I asked, well, what about all of the self-driving car industry? They should have this whole thing uh, working. Um, so this is the output of uh, you know, Tesla's autopilot. Um, and you can see that it's pretty good, right? But you can see all this, this kind of flickering. Sometimes a pedestrian is there, sometimes uh, he isn't, which is, which is not a good thing. Uh, for when you have an aircraft in the air. Um, so what about the academics who work on self-driving cars? It takes a little while for technology from academia to come to industry. So what, are the, uh, what, are the, uh, what about the academics that work on self-driving cars? They must be on top of this. They must know uh, how to solve this, right? Um, but you can... So that's a little bit about the research we're doing and all that sort of stuff. I just want to say we've got lots of problems. So the state of the art looks high, but actually if you look at, say, a state of the art object detector running in real time in an office, look how, um, look how much it flickers on and off. Sometimes it gets the wrong detections. So there's still a lot of problems, even now. Even though it looks solved, there's still a lot of problems, even with, um, with uh, deep networks. And, uh, and so some people have asked whether you have more data, train them. All right, so you know the, the flickering problem seems to be quite pervasive. Um, so what's the problem? Um, I'm going to claim it's a lack of invariance. So this is a study um, from Professor De, Color, De Carlo's lab, and published in the Journal of Neuroscience, where he where he basically uh, uh, looked at a, sort of a comparison between human and machine performance. Uh, so the idea is you take random background images, um, you have uh, 3D models of objects, and you can render them into the into the image, right? At di various different viewpoints under various di different illumination conditions, so on. Um, and then you can sort of ask a human to classify 
uh, the, the object. And you can ask a deep learning system to, to classify the object. And um, you can measure the performance. And there's also primates in the study as well. Um, and you can see, all right, so the deep learning is good in a number of tasks. But for this one, this kind of, these kinds of tasks, which are quite representative of what happens when you're dealing with aircraft, you're coming in at an oblique angle, and so on and so forth, um, you know, the performance of the latest deep learning uh, neural networks are not uh, very good compared to humans. Um, so yeah, so deep learning systems are not invariant, unlike humans, to viewpoint illumination, partial occlusions, quantization, etc. Um, and you can even fine tune things on this on these synthetic data sets and so on. Um, but that that still doesn't work. Um, and of course, I mean, if you have enough data, whatever that is, maybe trillions of images, so on, uh, labeled, and uh, you have you know very uh, huge clusters and all that. Uh, perhaps uh, you're going to increase the performance, but you know, in industry, we don't really have time to wait for all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we need to sort of move ahead anyway. Uh, so this is that, that was sort of synthetic images, but now there's a, a recent paper coming out, 2019, which just looked at video. You you apply your detector or classification to one image, you go a few frames ahead. Um, and then all of a sudden the classification changes, right? So we can go from domestic cat to monkey um, just a few frames ahead. And the changes that you see are almost imperceptible, right? So, uh, so this is what the conclusion of that paper is. Our analysis demonstrates that perturbations occurring naturally in videos pose a substantial challenge to deploying convolutional neural networks in environments that require, that require both reliability and low latency predictions. Um, yeah, and so this is an even more surprising case. Uh, so this was a paper by uh, Azule and Weiss where they just took, um, you know, state-of-the-art convolutional neural networks that were trained on ImageNet and just noticed the fact that if you shift the image, um, you, the predictions can vary drastically. Um, and this was sort of a systematic study um, and they showed that up to sort of 30% on modern CNNs, uh, the prediction uh, uh, can, can change. Um, so that's kind of surprising because what we learn with convolutional neural networks is there's a convolution it's supposed to be well behaved with respect to translation. And then there's these pooling operations which is supposed to give you some invariance to translation. Um, but clearly this, this shows that, that, that that's not the case. Um, so this whole idea of invariance has always been a big problem in computer vision. Um, it's nothing specific to deep learning. Um, and there's been a long history in this, uh, in this area. Um, so I want to just briefly mention some of the history because it's been kind of a roller coaster in terms of, uh, in terms of w what's going on. Um, so in the 80s and 90s, it was sort of the big thing uh, in computer vision. Everyone was in search of those. Uh, invariance uh, literature in the 90s suggested that what, uh, what people were searching for did not exist, right? So there was a paper by Reisman who said that, well, viewpoint ex invariants don't exist. Uh, there was a paper later which showed that uh, illumination invariance didn't, didn't exist. So li this looks like bad news. Um, but, you know, if you consider the problem a little bit more uh, detail, uh, under certain constrained models of illumination, you can, you can show that invariants do exist. Um, and that non-existence of viewpoint invariants led to the surge of local uh, invariant features where you sort of uh, didn't want to search for a very general case invariants, but just very sm a very uh, a small restricted viewpoint, uh, viewpoint transformations. Uh, so there's some work I did uh, along with Stefano Suato where uh, we showed that uh, if you look at viewpoint invariance of the photometry rather than the geometry of the, of the 3D structure, you can show that they're, they're, they're in fact, uh, these invariants do exist. At the time, we didn't really have any, uh, a very practical system, um, so that kind of died down. Um, right now, everyone, I mean, I mean there are, co of course, people working on this problem of invariance, um, but the large majority are not. Uh, and uh, so, Right now, 2020 is what is going to happen. Well, I hope that uh, invariance will, uh, uh, we, we, re we revisit invariance in the terms of deep learning. 
And so today it's going to be uh, a very, very small step um, in that direction. Um, and so we're going to look at uh, solving this most basic invariance uh, and the lack of translation invariance in CNNs. And I should say that you know, a lot of the met methods I'm going to say um, are you know, uh, quite, quite simple, but I, I think uh, putting it together in a framework is, is, is quite interesting and um, uh, shows, shows you something. Um, so I want to make it clear what I mean by invariance. So every, there's a lot of people who have different versions of what invariance is. So what I mean here is that if I shift, if I move the camera, um, an in-plane translation of the camera, that's going to correspond to a shift of the image. Uh, and what I want in an invariant descriptor is that I want, uh, what, what an invariant descriptor is, is just some representation of the image which does not change um, as, 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 as you move the, as you translate the camera. Um, so that's different than something called covariance where, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the representation of the image, the feature representation of the image, then a translation of that uh, of the image is is going to also correspond to a translation um, of the of of that feature representation. So that's a different notion. It's called covariance. So some people call it equivariance. Um, I'm going to mainly talk about this invariance, but I'll mention this at some in in some in, at some point. Okay. So before we get to how we get this translation invariance in deep networks. I'm going to go back and we should ask, how do we get invariants? How do we construct an invariant descriptor or feature anyway? Um, so here's kind of the process, very, very simple um, idea. Um, but this is, this is how you do it. Um, so imagine that you have, uh, so I'm going to treat the image as belonging from R2 to R. So I'm going to assume that you know, there's an infinite field of view of the camera. So you get this image with R2 to R. Um, so in one, in one dimensional, I'm going to sort of depict the image as this. Okay? So for illustration, I'm just going to say that the image is this one little impulse function. Right? It's one, one little dot in the image. Um, so if I translate the image, I'm going to use this notation here, TSI. If I translate the image, I'm going to you know, essentially do that to the image. Right? If I shift by 2, I'll, I'll shift to the, to the left by 2. Um, and so now what you can do um, is do something that looks a little bit stupid, but bear with me. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to translate the image by s pixels, right? Um, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna consider all of those translations of the image, right? So you're going to get this. Here's the original image. You're going to translate by one pixel, two pixel, et cetera, all, and also to the left. Now I'm just going to sum all of these, right? So I'm going to just sum all of these. And, I'm going to, and that, that, of course, is the invariant. Why? Well, so if I sum all of this, what am I going to get? I'm just going to get this, uh, all, all of these ones, right? So what's the proof? Uh, yeah, it's a very simple change of variables, right? Um, so I probably have to cut this short, so I'm not going to go through the details. But it's a very simple change of uh, variables. Um, and the sum of these is just this constant, right? And you can see if you, if I shift this thing, um, I'm going to get the same thing, right? So that that is invariant to shift. Okay, so um, in practice, I don't need to to really physically translate the image um, by all possible translations. Um, I can equivalently so this this value here is just the sum of all all of the pixels, right? So that that's 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 uh, that, that's sort of the proof, and I, I guess it's, a, again, a change of variable. So instead of considering all possible translated images and summing them, I can equivalently just sum all the pixels in the image, and then, re and then at each location put the average uh, or, or the uh, sum value there. Right? Um, so yeah, so this, this says that you know, there's an equivalence of pooling over the translation group and, and, and spatial averaging. OK, so what's the problem here? Um, well, can we just use this average value as a feature? You'll probably, if you know anything about computer vision, then you'll say, yeah, that's a bad idea. Why? Because um, I have these two images. They have two different uh, average values. But if I um, uh, compute the average, uh, and if I sort of normalize the images such that they have the same average, 
um, I'm going to get something that looks exactly the same here. So if we were to use the average value as a discriminator, um, it would, it would, it, in this case, it would say that these are two different images, or two different objects. So in this case, they would be the same object. So that's not a good idea. Um, so it, average value is invariant to translation, but it's a poor classifier. So why did I tell you about this? Well, we can sort of, uh, we can build on that fact a little bit, and we can, uh, we can instead of averaging over all possible translations, we can just average over a small, uh, a small set of translations, right? A limited set of translations. So instead, I just sum like this. And so what does that do? Um, so this, if I, so let's suppose I have an image that looks like this, and then this is the translated image by, say, one pixel. Um, then uh, if I compute this feature, it's going to look something like this, right? Where the height of this is just 1 over n. Um, now, if I, look at the, if I look at that shifted image, I compute that, I'm going to get something that looks like that, right? So now if I take the difference between these two, um, I'm just going to get, so absolute difference between these two and sum all of them, I'm going to get 2. Whereas in this case, I'm going to get 2 over n. So, um, so as you can see here, this is a little less sensitive to translation uh, than, than that is. Right? So we can, we can still uh, so get some insensitivity to translation um, uh, by, uh, by doing sort of this limited average. Um, and so this, what I mean by insensitivity mathematically is that if I look at the difference between the feature and the uh, feature of the translated image, then I can bound this by some constant that doesn't depend on s um, and the size of the translation. Um, yeah, so point here is that we don't, in practice, we don't need something, we don't need a fully uh, invariant descriptor so long as the classification doesn't change. Um, and so this idea is, you know, it's not something that's really new here. Um, it's just ideas that have been around um, in this whole generation of local invariant descriptors. In fact, uh, there's paper um, 2000, uh, which is called Geometric Blur, which sort of has these kinds of ideas there. Um, so back to deep learning. The um, question is, uh, can we just sort of blur the image and then input the image into our uh, convolutional neural network? Um, well, the answer is no, because after the first layer, you may not guarantee that uh, insensitivity. So we have to be a little bit smarter. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to enforce the insensi translation insensitivity through, uh, uh, throughout the network. Um, and so we're going to enforce that the convolutional kernels are, uh, are smooth kernels. Um, and so the question is, well, if we just hand code these, uh, these filters, is that, is that, is that going to compete with uh, these learned approaches? Um, well, that's where this gauss uh, hermite approximation theorem comes in. Um, so you can take whatever kernel you have, and uh, you, can, so you can approximate it by a linear combination of derivatives of, the gaussian, uh, of a Gaussian. Okay, so what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do is we're going to learn those coefficients rather than um, the pixel values of the kernel. Um, and there's uh, some literature on uh, human vision, which, ha which, which has some theory about how the human visual system works. Um, and there's some theory that says, well, what the human visual system is doing something similar to Gaussian filtering. Um, and it doesn't use too, mu too many derivatives, up to uh, two, between 2 and 4 um, is where the majority of, of, of the information is contained in. OK, um, so the, each of these Gaussians and its derivative lead, lead to um, translation insensitive kernels. Um, so I said that, so rather than learning pixel values of the kernels, we're going to use this gauss hermite approximation. Um, so this is, this is how a layer of a conventional neural network looks like. So you have the input from the previous layer. There's a convolution with the kernel. Um, the recent, uh, sort of more recent work is using 3 by 3 kernels uh, for the majority of the time. Um, then there's this nonlinearity, so there's this uh, rectification. I take the max between the, um, the output and, and zero. And then there's a, there's a way to reduce down the image to something uh, s smaller in size. So that could be subsampling, pooling, whatever, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, so what, we're, what you can do is you can think of this 3 by 3, three kernel as being a linear uh, combination of uh, various different basis functions. Uh, and these basis functions are just um, indicator functions. So what we're doing is just changing that basis uh, to this uh, derivative, the Gaussians and its derivatives. Um, and that's, that's really all the change is. Um, and with this, we can, you know, I, we can actually show some insensitivity. Um, so I, I want to mention some sort of related work. Uh, so there's, there's some, uh, to be quick, uh, uh, because I, I started late, so I probably have to go quick. But um, yeah, there's some ideas that were motivated that, that are already there in the literature. So there's a the work of scattering uh, transforms by Stefan Malat. Um, who like sort of designs these wave uh, hierarchical feature transform uh, to get insensitivity to translation and and, um, uh, and deformation, and uh, but none of this is learned. Um, and there's some other recent work, uh, 2016, which actually uses these Gauss-Hermite uh, functions, but their motivation is to sort of reduce the number of parameters in the network, and they don't analyze um, sensitivity to translation and so on. And there's several other works using this um, now for various other motivations. Um, so this is our result. So this is like say a layer of, a layer of the network, um, just exactly what I showed you before. Um, and what we can prove is uh, with this kind of bound like this. So if I have a stacked version of these layers uh, and then I do an average pooling at the end, um, then uh, I, can, you, I can sort of bound the difference between the feature and the uh, translated feature by 1 over sigma to the 2n. Um, and then this is the, this is the uh, Lipschitz constant less than 1 to the nth power. Uh, and then there's these product of the weights. And then this is the size of the feature. And then this is our uh, translation amount. So what's happening here is, as you can see, as, as, as sigma gets large, uh, this, as you sort of layer more and more things, um, this is getting more and more insensitive uh, to translation. Um, so I, I have to point out that it, this also depends on the training process, right? So these are weights that are learned. Um, and so we have to add some weight regularization so that uh, this, this doesn't go out of control. Um, so we can also do things like we can, we can also generalize this to deformations. Uh, so deformations look something like that, and the reason they're interesting is because viewpoint changes of uh, of the uh, of the camera correspond to deformations or diffeomorphisms um, of the domain, and uh, also 3D articulations and things like that correspond to transformations of the domain. All right, so let me get into some empirical demonstration of this idea. So what we did was take, say, like uh, the ResNet. Uh, so this is one of the most popular convolutional neural networks for image classification. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to take the 3 by 3 kernels uh, in that deep network, keep everything else the same. Um, and uh, we're going to change that to this Gauss-Hermite uh, approximation. Um, and what we call, we call this a Gauss net. Uh, so implementation, so the implementation de details is um, it's not very hard to to implement this, uh, you can use, so all of this is supported with the current back propagation tools with uh, PyTorch and uh, um, uh, TensorFlow, things like that. Uh, so the main point is that we have to implement these convolutions with FFTs, um, but that is supported in these um, packages um, for the most part. Um, so we tested things on a data set like CIFAR 10. Um, so this is you know, a typical data set, 60,000 images, 50,000 training, 10,000 test. Um, and the task is to classify. And so this is how we evaluate. Um, so we take uh, the test images, we shift them by one pixels in all these particular directions, and we measure the probability of change um, uh, in the classification. Um, and also, uh, we, per, uh, we, we also measure the probability of uh, change of at least one of these. So two different metrics, uh, th uh, these should be low, right? Um, so there's some different shifting conventions. Uh, so when you shift the image, there's always what do you do at the border? Um, and uh, so in, the, in, one, in one of our protocols, what we do is we just fill in 
these values with the corresponding uh, pixel values in the original image. Um, in, this, uh, in this one, what we do is we uh, take uh, the image, downsample it down to 30 by 30, um, and then zero pad it, so that it's a 32 by 32 image. We train on these, these images. Um, and then when we shift, uh, we just shift in a regular way, and then we just zero pad. Okay, so those are two different ways of doing this. Um, they were also something similar to this paper that was uh, already published. Uh, so this is, this is what uh, the graphs sort of look like during training. Uh, these are different uh, epochs during, during training. These are the sensitivity scores. Uh, so right now, just pay attention to uh, this red, red line and this, uh, this blue line. So you can see the sensitivity decreases. I'll explain what anti-aliasing is in, in a few minutes. Um, and you see a similar pattern with, this, uh, with the second measure. Um, and you get similar, similar patterns um, that you see here as well on this, uh, this other version of this CIFAR-10 zero-padded uh, data set. Um, in terms of the training accuracy, pretty much all of the models get uh, very similar uh, test accuracy, um, but the Gauss net is much less sensitive. Um, so here, the, like the final results, you can see the test errors are all very similar. So we tested it on various different uh, incarnations of the ResNet, so 18-layer uh, version versus a 50-layer uh, version. Um, and you can see that the sensitivity is reduced. This no subsampling is uh, performing no subsampling. So if you perform no subsampling, theoretically, it should be fully translation invariant. Um, but uh, it's, so you would think that this should be zero, but there's all these edge effects that also come into, a, into place. So it's not going to per be perfectly zero. Um, so yeah. So in terms of the architecture sizes, pay attention to these two. Uh, so the Gauss net is actually smaller um, in terms of the memory cost of this um, because there's fewer parameters, right? So we had these six parameters instead of the nine parameters um, of the typical convolutional kernel. Um, in terms of speed, uh, so the trading speed is roughly the same. Maybe it's like 2x more or something like that for the same number of epochs. But uh, inference is, much, is, is a bit more, so it's, it's, it's 7x. Um, but we haven't really optimized everything so far. All we did was take the ResNet, which is the design was chosen for different reasons, and we just took exactly that same thing, replaced it, tried to demonstrate the idea. Um, how much how much time do I? Who's it's like fifteen minutes? Fifteen minutes? Okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I I should say that you know this whole issue is not completely resolved in the sense that you know the bounds that we have are based on the sigma. The higher you choose sigma, the more insensitivity you're going to get. Um, but you know, how do you choose that parameter, um, really? Uh, and uh, so there's, there's no, I mean, I mean so if you, if, you, if you choose sigma large, it's going to also reduce the test accuracy, because you, you have very core scale features that sort of blur out everything. Um, so that, that's sort of not resolved. I'm going to skip this uh, proof due to uh, time, but um, I should say that the proof of insensitivity is not that difficult. It's just based on you know, uh, very simple calculus, very simple calculus estimates. But the main idea here is that um, the main idea is that when, when you represent the kernel as a weighted combination of these Gaussians, the Gaussians are smooth, and what you can show is that the difference between what, when you sort of calculate this, this, uh, this estimate, you're going to show that it actually depends on the difference between the Gaussian and the shifted Gaussian, which you can bound, which is very, which you can bound by by this kind of thing, and then layering it, you sort of sort of propagates through as well. So it's not that difficult. Um, what, where am I here? So, yeah. So you know, why are the conventional CNNs not? Uh, uh, why why are, why may they not be uh, insensitive? Well. Uh, uh, well, it's because of this. So if you sort of look at the estimate, you have to have that the difference between the kernel and the shifted kernel should be small. But in practice, you, there's nothing that enforces that. Um, when you train, you don't typically enforce smoothness of the kernel. Um, 
And you can sort of see like this, if you look at the kernel and the shifted kernel, you look at the difference, this, this is going to be high because there's not smoothness. And then over here, you're going to have edge effects. Um, yeah, so I don't, don't want to talk too much about the detail, but you know, there's, uh, you can try to correct this up by doing a, uh, a pooling um, at, uh, at, at the layer, uh, at the end of each layer. Um, but if you subsample, that's going to break it. So what you can show is that the difference between, say, the convolved output and uh, the shifted convolved output is going to look something like this. And because there's no smoothness, uh, there's typically not any uh, guarantee of the smoothness of the input coming in, uh, as well as the kernel, this can actually be quite large. All right, so yeah, that's, that's the reason there. Um, so there's another approach that is in the literature, um, sort of a called anti-aliasing approach. Um, and the idea is it sort of comes from signal processing uh, principles, where when, if you take a signal processing course, um, the slogan there is you shouldn't subsample without uh, anti-aliasing or low-pass filtering first. Um, and that's oftentimes ignored in uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, and that low-pass uh, low filtering preserves an approximate version of translation covariance, and that is a result, very old result. Um, and uh, within our framework, we can also show that this is translation insensitive um, as well. So that sort of works out in terms of being insensitive. Um, and so the idea here is that it sort of keeps the sensitivity of the original kernel and then does anti-aliasing to sort of undo the sensitivity at the end. Um, but, you know, so typically, you know, in, you know when, when we're designing convolutional neural networks, um, you know, it's not the case that we're trying to reconstruct the, the signal, right? So what we're trying to do in, uh, really is we're trying to do classification. So we have this very big, you know, billions, millions of pixels, and we're trying to reduce it down to something very small. So the idea is not to really try to reconstruct things. Um, so uh, there may be more direct ways to translation and sensitivity than trying to uh, do this kind of anti-aliasing. Um, and you know, in our work, we're, we're not trying to sort of prove or disprove one approach is better than the other. We're trying to just sort of derive principles and explain um, things. But we did come across this case where this anti-aliasing approach is, is much worse. Um, and that's this case of this zero this sort of uh, shifting and then zero padding at the end. Um, and you know, I can't completely say I understand fully why, that, why that's happening, but um, in this case, you're sort of the new information or new data that you're introducing and removing um, is, is, is sort of, uh, uh, is more of a drastic change than in this case where the information that you're removing and adding in is essentially redundant. Um, and so these three by three kernels are very sensitive uh, to these kind of small corruptions. Um, and this may look like sort of a, uh, you know, a very ideal case. Why do we care about this? Well, in practice, when you do a translation of the camera, uh, there's always issues of visibility, right? So there's always the issue that something comes into view and something goes out of view. Out of view. Um, and so we have to not only be invariant to translation, but we also have to be robust to these kinds of occlusion phenomena. So that has to be uh, thought about in terms of the design as well. Um, all right, I'm doing good. Um, in terms, so you know, so I would like to say, well, you know, uh, you, we have the whole backbone. We put it into the state-of-the-art object detector, and you know, we solve this whole flickering issue, but. Uh, this is ongoing work, um, so maybe in a few months or something we'll have all of that done. Um, but to summarize the talk, um, so current CNNs lack many human intuitive invariances. Uh, current CNNs lack invariance to translation, uh, though convolution and pooling are used. Um, uh, and this is attributed to the lack of smoothness enforced in the kernels. Um, and this can be made translation uh, insensitive by enforcing smoothness. 
uh, via Lipschitz uh, smooth basis. Um, and there still remains issues. Uh, so this is it's not completely a solved issue. As I said, there's this dependence on scale. Um, larger you choose it, the more insensitive. Um, but then there's also issues of accuracy. Um, and so also we need to sort of, what we didn't really explore too much is that we can also enforce some of this during the training, which we didn't really do, because, it, because the sensitivity de depends on the weights that are learned. So you can try to enforce some of that in the training as well. Um, so the big key step to sort of move this on is try to figure out invariance to viewpoint in deep networks. That's a big um, step. So you know the typical things like in-plane in rotations, um, scaling, that kind of stuff. You know, there's ideas out there. It's not that it's not that big of an issue. Um, I'm not going to say it's trivial, but it's you know it's there's ideas out there. Um, the viewpoint there's not there's not really that many ideas there. Um, so we where are we going? So we we think this is uh, sort of a big step. There's a whole literature on adversarial robustness, um, and uh, there, you're, you can sort of prove robustness for very small networks to small additive perturbations, which is a good step. Um, but when you're talking about vision applications, you also have to consider domain disturbances. And we have something now that can handle these domain disturbances. So we can actually um, use some of these verification methods to actually prove um, that uh, you have robustness, provable uh, robustness. So that's kind of our next step uh, going forward. Um, so that's all I have. Um, and you know, um, this is just getting going. Um, so uh, uh, I'm getting started on this. And uh, we're always looking to hire. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. Thank you. That's occlusion phenomena. That was what I was uh, talking about here. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's something that has to be tested empirically. But if you just shift by a little bit, a little amount, it's kind of similar to this case. Um, so what what happens when you shift the camera? It's unex unexpected. So those are sort of small corruptions or whatever. But since we have these large kernels, they're quite they're pretty robust to those sort of small corruptions. So it shouldn't change too drastically. But if you have like very large occlusion, we can't we can't say anything about that. Yeah. I have a question. So, have you tried something naive, which would be to take your the traditional network, take all of the learned kernels, map them onto the basis element, and then just and then just use it without training. No, no. Then oh. retrain, but fix the network, but just adapt the shallow layer at the end to the modified feature space. In principle, would you get something that's in between? Would it be actually the same as yours? No. So I mean, we did something similar in the sense that we just took, we just took um, a, a regular train ResNet, took the coefficients, projected it onto the basis, and then see see what the outcome was. It wasn't too good. You have to retrain things. But in terms of like the last layer, we didn't try like just training the last. Probably it wouldn't yeah, work because it, we train re. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, you have to the last yeah, layer. but I think these are kind of yeah. These these things seem to be adapted to the. Yeah, they, they it seems there seems if like it, it. If it lives somewhere in between, yeah. I think that that would be strong evidence in favor of. Of your approach. Yeah, but it didn't. So you're, 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 the only difference between what you're saying and what we did seems to be just you're saying just retrain the last layer, right? So we didn't try that, but we we retrained the whole thing, right? So we just did the okay. Uh, yeah, okay, never mind. Then yeah. So okay, yeah. All right, we can try that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying if this lives in between, then that's evidence. Evidence in of what? Favor, in favor of the of, of your that's additional evidence in favor okay. of this kind of invariance, right? So yeah. Because that will lower it. Then what you're saying is, on top of that, if I now create a training regime that already lives in that space, that may have better 
convergence properties in terms of the landscape, right? Yeah. That, those, those are two different things, right? So you can sort of, it's like an ablation study. You can say, well, the landscape is crappy, but then I'm just going to map it onto this smoother basis. The other one is just have a smoother basis and a hook into a smoother landscape. Okay, one other question. Why? I find it awkward, like, I, I, I believe it's possible, so I'm not saying it's not, but I find it awkward that you're mapping, like, if you go back to your Gaussian basis slide, like, as someone who's like implemented these kinds of filters, I would never try to implement uh, those seven basic elements on a three by three. Now, I do believe it's possible if you give so me a it, random three by three matrix, I can project onto them, but I, 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 I feel like the kernel should be a little bit bigger. Keep going. I want to see the seven bases on the right hand side. Keep going. You had a picture of the, seven, the, the Gauss bases. Keep going all the way to the beginning. There, there. Okay, so like to make that nice picture, you don't use a three by three. But you mean this? The one on the right. This one, yeah. Yeah. Right. So normally to make that nice picture, we make the kernel a little bit yeah. bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Why not use slightly larger kernels? Well, the the the, the main reason. So they're they're not doing this for no reason, right? The three by three is par partially efficiency, right? You but can't. You No, I'm, I'm talking about the parameter efficiency, right? So three by three is because there's only nine parameters, right? So I mean, initially there was these, uh, I think like the AlexNet or whatever it was, 11 by 11, the first layer. Um, and then progressively it got more painful to train. So people used uh, smaller and smaller um, well, supports. Basis, since it's basis, basis. Yeah, yeah, but so it's this, the, 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 the yeah, so the difference here is that you're, I mean, we, we do have these larger support kernels, right? But but we only have a few parameters because we're just taking a linear combination of okay, them. Okay, it wasn't clear that the, the, the kernels were bigger. Okay, but in your own Yeah, it has to be bigger. Yeah, these, it's not, these are not three by three. Okay, which means that doing what I said in terms of taking those and then projecting them. Yeah, it's not a, it's not not a direct, reason. yeah, yeah. It's not reasonable. Yeah, oh, okay, well. You'd have to upsample them. And yeah, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah, so yeah, you have to implement things with FFT, um, which slows things down a little bit. And um, surprisingly, FFT um, has bugs in PyTorch um, distributed training. Came out with an FFT net, and they were able to do all the training. Yeah, we did all the training on, but once you start putting AWS and then distributed PyTorch training, there's some bugs that are still being worked out between AWS and Facebook. How big are your kernels? Well, it's the size of the feature map. So each for each um, for each uh, feature map, it's the size. The support is the size of the feature. So, yeah, one last mini question before we conclude. Yeah. Your background is very homogeneous. Why do you have a textured background? Is that for example? Um. No, I mean, as long as you train on those kinds of textured backgrounds. It has to be consistent texture or in between the various, various. Yeah, you can, you can have various, as long as you train with various different textures in the background, there shouldn't be any type of problem.